I've known Doc Hollingsworth for exactly 25 years now. I still remember where we were standing when we met uh, near the bookstore at Southern Seminary when he was visiting there with uh, some mutual friends. It takes a good friend to design a stewardship series and then leave town and leave you to preach. (laughs) Baptist's favorite message on wine. Yet that's what we have. (laughs) Doc has already told me that if the stewardship season goes well, he preached most of the sermons. If it does not go well in the pledge, I preached the last one. (laughs) Again, a good friend with that perspective. You've heard the jokes. You know the jokes. Uh, One of them says that uh, the only difference between Methodists and Baptists are that Baptists act like they don't know each other in the liquor store. You also know that while I wouldn't want to guess the percentage of the people in the room who are teetotalers, actually, it's probably small, the uh, percentage is slightly larger, though, of people who still labor under the possibility that Jesus was handing out Welch's grape juice at the Last Supper. We Baptists act as though that's what was happening at any rate, and so here we are today with this powerful story that we don't all together in the Baptist culture know what to do with. And so you've heard the text earlier from the second chapter of John, and we have this curious miracle that came in the very beginning of the recorded portion of Jesus' ministry. As I began to think about this and really try to make meaning of this story, the first reaction I had was not possibly uh, your first reaction. My first reaction was to say, thank goodness, that there are others in our lives who know better than we do what we need sometimes. So let me muse on that just for a second, and then I promise we'll take a journey uh, through this uh, text. One of the easiest and best examples of someone knowing better than we do would have been when I was being raised by my parents, and there were times when, when my brother and I had one set of ideas, and thankfully our parents had better ideas than we did about what we needed And so we are today the better for that. But then I thought of another example of someone knowing better than than we did. Doc wasn't the only person I met for the first time at seminary. I met Elizabeth for the very first time on the very first day of seminary. And believe it or not, and some of you won't believe this, Elizabeth knew before I did that we needed to spend the rest of our lives together. And thank goodness Elizabeth knew before I did that we needed to spend the rest of our lives together. She was right, and to this day, there are no shortage of you who tell me how fortunate I am that she knew this and that I went along with that. When we got married, we did the registry like everyone else does. We wanted plates and glasses and forks and knives, and we picked out a hand mixer and a cheap blender, and we registered for these kinds of things, and we wanted those because they were what we knew we needed. Now, Ed and Denise Withers in our Sunday school class at church knew, though, that what we really needed was a double-layered pizza pan, and someone else knew that we needed extra thick oven mitts. I wasn't worried about making a pizza at home at the time, and I really wasn't concerned with burning my hands, but we still used those oven mitts that we got from friends before we married, and we took that pizza pan out of the cabinet the other day for probably the thousandth time. Ed and Denise Withers knew better than we did what we needed. On a third day, presumably of a wedding feast that had already started, Jesus' mother pulled him away from the party and told him there was a problem. He needed to do something about the problem, and she wasn't taking no for an answer. Now, Linda McKinnish Bridges, a scholar who I respect a lot, points out that this moment early in Jesus' ministry happened in a blissful setting of joy and abundance. Cana, less than 10 miles north of Nazareth, is not mentioned in the New Testament except in John's Gospel. But she points out a a, a subtle, powerful shift in John's telling of this and that location. Because she points out that a little later in John's writing, and indeed it happened in the Gospel story you heard just a few minutes ago, Cana becomes no longer Cana, but Cana of Galilee. And that's going to become important to us in just a few minutes. There's something secretive that pastors know. 
weddings are accidents waiting to happen. They really are. Weddings are accidents waiting to be happened. They're very carefully planned accidents. But I, I have yet, in all the hundreds of weddings I've done in my career, I have yet to do the perfect one yet. Something, usually unbeknownst to everyone who's there, something always goes wrong. Nothing ever goes completely to script. Some of them end up on YouTube these days, and others of them end up on America's Funniest Home Videos. Robert Brearley, in his notes on this text, reminds us that something is always going on, and he also reminds us that the best stories, the best stories seem to emerge from weddings, these very solemn occasions that have been planned within an inch of their very lives, and uh, they also share that, uh, that reality with funerals, by the way. Ministers will tell you that we collect a group of stories all the way to the end of our careers that we can't tell until the end of our careers that come from these two most solemn settings. And so if we simply look at the story in isolation, the act itself, Jesus turned water into wine. The act itself is impressive enough. We admit that we don't understand all we know, though, about this first miracle. We, we like to drill down with this story and we like to play with the details. So let's do for a minute. In those days, the bride and groom celebrated, not with a honeymoon, but as you know, with a seven-day feast. Uh, this one, this one where Jesus was pulled aside by his mother and given a set of marching orders, had had the wheels fall off of it way too early. The wine had already run out, and for some reason, Jesus' mother felt responsible to do something about it. Jesus referred to his mother in this episode then, uh, who goes unnamed, by the way, in John's gospel. He refers to her simply as woman in his reply. And this is jarring to our, our very current and very American ears. Some people would suggest that this might have been more uh, expected and more common in that culture and in that time. But to us, it still sounds disrespectful at best. Others, though, believe that John is not wasting a detail in his gospel telling of this. John features Jesus calling his mother woman because it makes uh, something very, very important fall into place later when we reach the end and begin to really make meaning. John was doing analysis and theology as only a skilled writer could. And, and the use of woman could herald the uniqueness of the moment and the magnitude of the news being given not to an expected audience, but to his mother, woman. It also heralds the, with great notice that in God's kingdom, things are not going to exactly be as they have been. Then the miracle happened. What looks like a reluctant Christ my hour has not yet come, instructs the helpers to get six jars of water. And the water is now wine. You know this. But according to, Cla to Clarence Jordan, in the notes that accompany his cotton patch gospel, and Clarence Jordan was one of the most renowned scholars of his time, Clarence Jordan points out in the footnotes of John's gospel that the wording here in the Greek suggests that the wine they took to the steward for tasting was actually drawn from the well. It was not poured from the jars that Jesus had already instructed them to fill. Jesus had turned the whole well into wine. Amazing. The miracle of Christ is an amazing thing to behold, except for the fact that most of the scholars I pay attention to don't consider this primarily to be a miracle at all. Words really do matter. And a miracle does one important thing, but a sign does quite another. A miracle very necessarily points toward itself as a solution or an outcome in an important situation that remains open until that moment, but a sign. A sign points past itself to another place, another time, Another being, a good author, knows how to turn a detail so that it becomes foreshadowing. And if done well enough, we may read that detail and move past it and never quite catch on to what the writer is doing and only later come back around and realize, oh, he was or she was foreshadowing. Now, you avid 
mystery readers know that an author might, might set an, a character at an old reading desk. And he's reading a letter and he needs a magnifying glass. And so he begins to reach and look into the drawers and into the cubbies to find the magnifying glass. And on the way to finding that magnifying glass so that he can get back to the letter, his fingers brush across a revolver. And in your mind you say, oh, that gun could be important later. That's the only reason why they would share that detail with us. Or a character might who has suffered a lot, of, a lot of loss in her neighborhood and in her family. A character might in a story say, I'm so weary. I'm so tired of all the pain and all the death. And, and you as a reader might know that some trouble is still up ahead. Well, our New Testament readers, our, our New Testament writers rather, they were skilled in this. They dabbled in the fine art of foreshadowing. And if we pay attention, they left us trails to follow within these sacred words, trails that would lead us to moments that looked like one thing, but in time turned out to be quite another. Let me give you an example, one of the best known examples. If you glance over into Luke's gospel, it has one of these, these foreshadowings that hap happen, and it's done so subtly and so well that by the time we get to the punchline, we've almost forgotten the, the foreshadowing in the first place. The last days of Jesus' life, the death, resurrection in Jerusalem. Jesus goes on a journey that takes up the last few chapters of the Gospels where we see these stories depicted. And so in Luke's Gospel, we hear him in chapter 9 say, And Jesus turned his face toward Jerusalem. And then 15 chapters later, the passion of Christ unfolds. Jesus teaches. Jesus overturns tables. Jesus is on trial, and the whole thing unfolds. And then the death and resurrection after the crucifixion. And we forget that moment some 15 chapters earlier where Luke let us look over his shoulder, and he, and he told us what was coming. Jesus resolutely set his face toward Jerusalem. Luke was telling us that something important was going to happen in Jesus' life. And in doing so, he was bringing together, tying together, shining a light on what God was at work doing. Well, same thing here in John chapter 2. We think it's an amazing story. It strikes our eyes and our ears as a mere miracle. The mother of our Lord took a grown man and told him to do a miraculous work. And he protested first, as only, but, but as only a mom can do, she ran right through the relational stop sign that Jesus put down, my hour has not yet come. But then he reluctantly, it appears, in the telling of the story, set in motion what would lead to his first public act of supernatural ability. And we are appropriately impressed. The symbolism of dirty pedestrian water being turned into something of such high quality that those at the party marveled is a compelling image. And I don't know about you, but I need the hope that God can take something average and make of it above average, something else. I need the hope that God can take something dirty and make it pure. I need the hope that comes with a story of water that was only fit for bathing being turned into something that later was only appropriately appreciated through slow, measured sips. That gives me hope for my own living. But none of this, none of this, is the surprise of the story. All of this is miracle. And that would be enough if left alone, and if this were just a miracle. No, the, the power of the story may well be found in its unique dimension as a sign. A sign that pointed beyond the moment and the issue at hand. What Jesus did that day foreshadowed something far larger, something that we all need. What Jesus did that day was to give us an extravagant sign. And once we pick up on that sign, once we catch on to what Jesus was showing us, we can't be left quite the same. In Toni Morrison's story, Beloved, a white mountain girl named Amy Denver helps a pregnant woman named Seth to escape slavery. 
seeing Seth's bloody back torn from the whip and astonished by the degree of mutilation, Amy says, come here, Jesus. Wonder what God had in mind. One scholar says of this text that what God had in mind in John chapter 2 was abundance, extravagance. And the mother of Jesus does hear what the Amy Denver character does in that story. She nudges the divine and forces the question. Jesus and his ministry are introduced with these joyous symbols, the wedding, the feast, six Jewish ritual pots, thirsty wedding guests, and a lot of wine. And on this third day, we get a literary direction that points us toward God, what God had in mind all along. McKinnish Bridges says that this story is a type of resurrection story, offering us new birth and life from where there was death, fullness, where there had been emptiness before. In God's unfolding drama, the power of Christ is introduced by the sign and life for none of us should ever have to be the same. This act of foreshadowing in some ways bookends and gives us a chance to see coming the Easter victory of Christ. Christ has arrived. Christ has arrived and will leave a legacy of wonder working that fills our lives with meaning and hope and possibility. What humanity was about to find out was this. The host's wine could give out. But God in Christ has filled us with living water that cannot be exhausted. The hopes of the Old Testament have been realized. The word has been made flesh. The rich symbol of the story celebrates that God has given and now we will be called to give to. So what can we do with this great arrival that will really make it matter? How we respond to this extravagance really does become the issue. A box arrived the other day at our house, and Elizabeth and I knew that neither of us had ordered anything. The box was not a small one. Curious, we cut open the packing tape and all the while wondering what would be waiting inside. We had noticed that the box had a couple of stickers. One of them said, handle with care. The other one said, live. <laughs> now it had our full attention. So that we, we cut the box open very carefully. And waiting inside this box was something we couldn't have seen coming. Our friends had taken their kids to Hawaii over the fall break from school. And from there they had shipped us a beautiful live orchid. They were aware that uh, we had experienced some challenges lately. They knew that we had been uh, flooded from our home in part. Reconstruction was going on, and during that, they knew that we had suffered two deaths within our family, of course, Elizabeth's father being the most immediate of those. Still, who ships a live orchid to you to say they're thinking about you? And so it prompted the only proper reaction among two children of the South. A day or so later, I said to Elizabeth, did you write them a thank you note? Do I need to write them too? In the face of extravagant grace, the only proper response is likewise an extravagant thanks, a gracious thanks, and that thanks can be expressed in, in myriad ways, and of course we're in the stewardship season, and you're waiting for me to turn this around and squeeze out the remotest connection to your financial giving, and that's not where we're ending today. Now, John's Gospel, the story you heard read just a little while ago, gives us the proper thanks. It gives us the response that is fitting. So look back with me to the story once more. The mother of Jesus gives one simple instruction to the servants that some believe is part of the gospel, the big announcement here, the coming of Christ. His mother says to the servants in John chapter 2, do whatever he tells you. And there it is. 
there's our response. And I know do whatever he tells you sounds general. It sounds too broad. It sounds unattainable so that we don't really know what to do with that, right? But when we begin to apply some words that we do know to those, those words from his mother, do whatever he tells you, when we begin to apply words like grace, forgiveness, love, fairness, justice, and yes, generosity, well, those are doable. We can do those things. So we're left with the lavish sign, the extravagant sign, the surprise and the story and its claim on our lives, a gift in Christ that we didn't even know that we wanted, the red of the wine at the wedding, symbolizing blood, which foreshadowed Calvary. People of Jesus' time had tasted the law and said it was good, but soon, they would taste grace and say to God, you saved the best for last. When we do whatever he tells us, we bring life and spirit to the extravagant sign. We're going to stand just now and share in the closing of our service with hymn number 48, Great is thy faithfulness. You may have a response that'll do just fine right where you are. But if you need to come down front, we'd be happy to receive you into the life of the church. I'll be down here as we sing. Hymn number 48. Stand with us, if you will. <laughs>